look at anti-inflammatory drugs and carry on through the series of drugs called non steroidal anti-inflammatories. So a bit of a recap. Inflammation, we know, is a protective mechanism. It brings blood to the traumatized or infected area. It increases white blood cell migration, increases the activity of phagocytosis, and of course we know that there's normal processes of um, inflammation, and then there's those extended abnormal processes of inflammation. So inflammation begins with cell damage, which then sort of cleaves off the phospholipase from the phospholipid layer of the cell membranes to produce arachidonic acid. And through that process and eventual processes, we have production of mediators of inflammation, which of course are called eicosanoids. So we've got prostaglandins, thromboxins, and leukotrienes, which are eicosanoids. And these ones in particular are associated with cyclooxygenase. So that's the enzyme that has the byproduct of thromboxanes and prostaglandins. And then we'll talk about cyclooxygenase, so COX, COX1 and COX2. And then lipoxygenase is the enzyme that then creates leukotrienes, which is another form of eicosanoids. So when we talked about corticosteroids and specifically glucocorticoids, we know that they prevent that start of inflammation through prevention of that cleaving of phospholipase from the phospholipid border. And then we talked about NSAIDs, definitely with uh, COX inhibition of prostaglandins, plus or minus some of them have some influence on the creation of thromboxanes as well. So we're going to focus on NSAIDs as they inhibit the action of cyclooxygenase, which is COX. Some even inhibit that leukotrienes, but uh, not many. That's not their main mode of action. So non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are drugs that decrease inflammation, like corticosteroids, but they don't contain that molecular steroid ring structure, and they don't have many of the negative side effects of the gluco glucocorticoid drugs. NSAIDs are among the most rapidly expanding group of drugs used by veterinarians, and many of the veterinary drugs have come from the human medicine side as a re result of human beings being, um, humans being more sensitive to the effects of glucocorticoids. So they needed an alternative to glucocorticoids for inflammatory reactions uh, for humans that, of course, had negative reactions to glucocorticoids. So that's how NSAIDs came about. The majority of action of NSAIDs is based on the inhibition of cyclooxygenase, so that's COX, enzyme, which then results in the reduction <laughs> or a reduced production of prostaglandins, which equals reduced symptoms of inflammation. So working in that secondary pain relief format. Some NSAIDs, such as ketoprofen, ibuprofen, and tapoxylin, inhibit lipoxygenase, lipoxygenase and decrease their, their production. So essentially, some of them not only work with the COX inhibition, but they also work to prevent the production of lipoxygenase, which is reduced production of leukotrienes in the end. So ketoprofen, ibuprofen, and tapoxylin, typically in veterinary medicine, you might see ketoprofen used, and perhaps uh, tapoxylin, not so much in Canada, but we definitely don't use ibuprofen in dogs and cats. So we'll look at the differences between the two cyclooxygenase enzymes. We've got COX-1, which is responsible for creation of prostaglandins for the normal physiological regulation of organ function. So for example, COX-1 plays a very important role in causing the secretion of stomach protective mucus, maintaining blood supply to the stomach, and decreasing stomach acid production. COX-1 was also found to play a very important role in the kidney, where, it, where the, the COX-1 prostaglandins actually counteracted the vasoconstriction and allowed vasodilation of renal blood supply. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So COX-1 overall, the prostaglandins involved with the COX-1 enzyme are generally, generally beneficial to the body. And they create this protective feature against things like gastritis and gastric ulcers. COX-2, on the other hand, is the enzyme that produces the prostaglandins associated with clinical signs of inflammation, so those five key signs of inflammation. Thus, from a simplistic view, COX-1 could, could be said to be the good guy, and COX-2 could be the bad guy. Could be. That's one way to look at it. 
So COX-2 we know definitely has more involvement in creating the, that pain that results from the five signs of inflammation. So COX-1, typically the way it was looked at, especially in the 90s, when a lot of this, these studies on non sterile anti-inflammatories were starting out, in the 90s it really started off that COX-1 was fully the good guy and COX-2 was the bad guy. So COX-2 is responsible for everything bad and COX-1 was responsible for the great things in the body and their protective features. So the thought was... NSAIDs that selecti selectively inhibit COX-2 without significantly inhibiting COX-1 would theoretically be able to decrease inflammation without decreasing those protective features from the uh, production of those normal, healthy, physiological prostaglandins that support the stomach and the kidneys. This has been the advantage cited by the manufacturers of sort of the newer NSAIDs used in veterinary medicine since the 1990s. So this whole play on COX-1 versus COX-2 really started in the 90s, and a lot of the newer NSAIDs that are COX-2 inhibitors really stress that point that, yeah, we're just going to block COX-2, so therefore we're just going to block those five signs of inflammation, and we'll leave COX-1 alone. So that was the goal of a lot of the newer NSAIDs that strictly block COX-2, so getting rid of the bad guy and leaving COX-1. However, what they've learned is that it's not that simple. It, that would be an ideal world, and unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world. So it's been found that in mice, COX-2 actually can help play some role in the healing of gastric ulcers in mice, and COX-1 has been found to produce some prostaglandins that actually enhance the inflammatory reaction. In addition, most of the drugs with selective COX-2 inhibition lose some or all of the selectivity as the dose increases. So if we give a higher end dose, then of course the selectivity is gone and we're going to be blocking or inhibiting both COX-1 and COX-2. So it's not quite as an, an ideal picture as we thought it could have been. Still, COX-2 selective inhibitor NSAIDs do have some advantage over non-selective COX inhibitors as far as less side effects on the stomach and kidney at normal doses. So it's when we have to have those higher doses of the medication that we start to lose their selectivity. COX-2 inhibitors. COX-2 selective inhibitor drugs approved for use in veterinary medicine are car carprofen, which is Remedil, Daracoxib, which is Daramax, Meloxicam, which the trade name is Medicam, Fibro or Ferrocops, Coxib, such a hard one to say, is Prevacox, and then you may or may not see Etodolac, which is Etogesic. Quite often we don't use that, um, but the first four you'll definitely see at some point in your in your regular vet practice. So those ones specifically are COX-2 inhibitors. So looking at non-steroidals and pain, older NSAIDs reduce discomfort and pain primarily by decreasing those five signs of inflammation. So they worked on a secondary basis of pain. They didn't directly stop the perception of pain in the brain, but instead they helped to reduce inflammation, which in turn helped to reduce pain. Generally, they had very little true analgesic effect, which means that they didn't work on that CNS level, so they didn't decrease the perception. However, Newer NSAIDs appear to have an additional analgesic effect that can't be explained by anti-inflammatory anti activity alone. So we'll go through the individual non steroidal anti-inflammatories, and you'll note that some of them have dual action. So they reduce inflammation, but then some of them also have that secondary, or technically that primary, reduction in pain through a true analgesic effect. So the newer drugs, the newer non steroidal anti-inflammatories, some of them are now approved for use in preventing or diminishing post-operative surgical pain, which is great. Even though analgesic properties are attributed to some non steroidals they're not very strong analgesics by themselves, and they're not very effective by themselves in relieving severe visceral pain, so pain associated with organs such as the intestine or colic in the horse. And they're also not very good on their own for relieving severe somatic pain, which is pain associated with the body surfaces, such as burns or severe abrasions. 
So they are often used in combination, typically during a surgical protocol, whereby we'll give the non anti-inflammatory either at the start of surgery or during surgery in combination with opioids to carry that analgesic process through. So they're not great on their own, but they can be really great in combination. NSAIDs also can play an increasing role in what's being referred to as preemptive analgesia, which refers to the use of drugs before surgery or traumatic tissue manipulation to reduce the amount of pain perceived by the patient. So of course we know that during wind-up, the spinal cord still has that ability to modulate pain, and then once the animal is awake and the anesthetic drugs have worn off, all of a sudden that modulation of pain gets sent to the brain as a perception of pain and of course it gets amplified. That's what pain windup is. So when we use non anti-inflammatories as part of our pain management protocol, they can play an active role in that reduction of pain windup and that reduction of amplification of pain to the brain as perception. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and protein, it's important to note that non, um, NSAIDs are tightly bound to protein carrier molecules. So caution with patients who have hypoalbuminemia, albuminemia, which is a reduction in albumin floating around in the bloodstream, or hypoproteinemia, which is overall reduction in protein in the, in the bloodstream as well. If they have less protein, then they have less protein molecules available to carry the non anti-inflammatories. So the risk is that if we give the same dose of non anti-inflammatories, then of course there's a risk that we will induce more non anti-inflammatory molecules than they have protein available. And those non will then enter direct circulation right away instead of relying on being a carrier or being carried by a protein. So they could potentially circulate and be taken into that whole circulation faster, which is, of course, a risk for an overdose. So the more common side effects of non anti-inflammatories occur in the gastrointestinal tract. There are good prostaglandins as well. So prostaglandin E and prostaglandin I2 are two types of prostaglandins that normally decrease the volume, acidity, and pepsin content of gastric secretions released during normal digestion. So if we look at those, of course, the volume and the acidity of the gastric contents that if we're reducing that or if we're sort of blocking that to a degree, then it means that the stomach acid will be less acidic and potentially less harmful to the stomach wall itself and the duodenum, that part of the small intestine. And likewise, pepsin, we know, is a conversion of pepsinogen, and pepsin is proteolytic. And if we have an increase in pepsin, then it means that there's potential that that pepsin could just be floating around the stomach, and if there's no food to uh, no food protein to digest, it could start digesting the tissues of the stomach. So a reduction in pepsin, that proteolytic enzyme, is a good thing as a protective measure to help protect the stomach and the duodenum. So they also increase, these prostaglandins also increase perfusion of the gastric mucosa, and they stimulate gastric and enteric mu mucus production, so mucus production in the stomach and the small intestines, and they stimulate turnover and repair of the gastrointestinal epithelial cells. So these healthy or good prostaglandins play an important role in maintaining the health of the gastrointestinal tract through protection of the lining from the harsh environment of the stomach and the stomach acids, and by facilitating healing should an injury in the stomach lining actually occur. So these good prostaglandins we want to keep in mind as we start talking about blocking prostaglandins through the use of NSAIDs. So the bad news, of course, is that non-selective COX inhibitor NSAIDs block production of all prostaglandins. So that includes both COX-1 and COX-2 blocking, which of course is going to block the good prostaglandins and the bad prostaglandins, which is unfortunate. So the net effect, the end result, can be a reduced ability to withstand the acidic stomach contents, which could result in gastritis, which is inflammation of the stomach. And if the superficial cells of the stomach lining are eroded away, then of course we can get gastrointestinal ulcers as well. So in the end, if we are non-selectively blocking COX-1 and COX-2, then of course we're non-selectively blocking the good prostate gastrointestinal problems similar to the effects of glucocorticoids.
which is one of the reasons we want to avoid glucocorticoids fairly often is because of these GI effects. So we have to be cautious with the use of NSAIDs for this reason. Likewise, and this is just a heads up, we're going to go into like 10 slides about the bad things of, of non steroidal anti-inflammatories. So NSAIDs also have an effect on the kidney. non steroidal anti-inflammatories block beneficial prostaglandins that help regulate the renal blood supply, so the kidney blood supply, under conditions of hypotension, so decrease of arterial blood in the body, or de de um, sorry, decrease in arterial blood pressure in the body, the body normally causes vasoconstriction of renal arterioles in an attempt to channel the blood to the essential organs. So this reflex is beneficial for the overall body if it's used for a short period of time, so during short periods of hypotension. But a severe decrease in blood flow to the kidney or any tissue or organ, of course, will result in the cells not obtaining enough blood and then dying from a lack of oxygen. So they get localized or generalized tissue hypoxia which is a lack of oxygen in those tissues. So to prevent a marked decrease in blood flow to the kidney under conditions of hypotension, prostaglandin E2, so a good prostaglandin, is released by the kidney. This prostaglandin dilates the renal arterioles and allows continued perfusion of kidney cells despite the decreased blood pressure and reduced overall renal perfusion. So essentially E2 is a good prostaglandin that jumps into action during times of prolonged hypotension to ensure that those kidneys don't get cut off from oxygenated blood circulation. So if these hypotensive conditions and the vasoconstriction of the renal vasculature occur while an animal is being treated with non steroidal anti-inflammatories, then unfortunately the protective vasodilating prostaglandins will be blocked, they'll be inhibited, and the kidney will be unable to offset the stimulus for renal vasoconstriction. So blood flow to the kidney will be severely reduced and parts of the kidney could actually die from ischemia, which is lack of oxygen availability. The renal papillae are the projections in the renal collecting ducts that dump urine into the collecting cavity, so into that renal pelvis within the kidney. These papillae have relatively sparse blood supply and are very susceptible to decreased renal blood flow. So under these conditions of really poor perfusion, the renal papillae actually die from the tissue ischemia, producing the condition called renal papillary necrosis. So again, we have to be very cautious about which animals are we're, we're choosing or we're working through a treatment plan to use non steroidal anti-inflammatories with. If they have prolonged hypotension, we have to be very, very cautious because already they're going to have reduced renal blood flow because of this um, this hypotension, it's cutting off circulation to the kidneys to preserve other organs. And then, of course, if we block the good prostaglandins that would increase that blood flow to the kidney, then we're just making it worse for that patient. So never in a hypotensive patient, never in a dehydrated patient. So more about the kidneys. Interestingly, COX-2, the enzyme that normally produces prostaglandins associated with inflammation, so the bad prostaglandins, also produces prostaglandins in the kidney that are needed for normal renal function. So COX-2 selective inhibition NSAIDs are not significantly safer for prevention of renal problems than the older non-selective NSAIDs. So that's something to keep in mind. It's hard because general rule is yes, COX-2 selective inhibitors are a little bit better, especially for gastrointestinal function, and they have some degree of renal efficient or uh, renal benefits as well, but not in this specific case. And then there's more about the kidneys. So this is there, you know, non steroidal anti-inflammatories. We got to watch out with our kidney cases. So aside from that papillary necrosis associated with non steroidal use in hypotensive patients, it's also been suggested that at higher doses, some NSAIDs could actually be directly toxic to the renal tubules and can be just completely nephrotoxic. So higher doses of NSAIDs is more likely to cause this, and of course prolonged use of higher doses of NSAIDs. So what they say when you get a referral to speak with somebody about the use of NSAIDs in patients who may or may not be a renal case, what they say is in healthy animals who you know show no clinical signs other than whatever it is that we're treating, so inflammation, then technically non steroidal anti-inflammatories shouldn't cause renal disease. So they shouldn't cause renal disease. They shouldn't cause renal failure. However, 
if that animal is predisposed to acquire renal disease, if they are, if they have the genes that are just ticking time bombs and they're predisposed to getting uh, kidney disease, then the use of NSAIDs can kind of push them to that threshold so they can unmask renal disease. So something that's really important for us and typically our role is quite often we are uh, taking blood to run a renal panel or even they have non steroidal anti-inflammatory panels to check those kidney values prior to starting non steroidal anti-inflammatories. Because if they have any elevation in their kidney enzymes, then we don't want to be using non steroidal anti-inflammatories. Another fun fact, with the increasing use of non steroidals especially the COX-2 selective NSAIDs, veterinarians have become aware of the hepatotoxicity, so the liver toxicity potential of NSAIDs. All NSAIDs, so the COX-1 and the non-selective inhibitors, have the potential to produce hepatotoxicity. The effect is thought to be idiosyncratic, meaning that factors that predispose an animal to this are unknown. So we don't know exactly what would predispose an animal to hepatotoxicity, and the occurrence of the problem is unpredictable. It occurs with low frequency, and it's not thought to be associated with pre-existing liver problems, which is crazy to me. So the presence of elevated liver enzymes on blood chemistry panel is not a contraindication for NSAID use, which again, I just find incredible. However, I find most veterinarians will avoid using NSAIDs if an animal has increased liver enzymes in their blood just as a precaution and because they don't want to be that person who then pushed that animal past their threshold and increased their liver values. So the tolerance overall of NSAIDs is definitely related to the species. There's a lot of differences. As a general rule, the incidence of gastrointestinal side effects is reported much more frequently in dogs than in horses. And whether it's a form of or sorry, whether it's from overall use of NSAIDs, because we use them quite often in the dog, and we just get to see those side effects more often, um, or not, we don't know. However, older NSAIDs, such as phenobutazone, which we'll talk about, have been used for lots of years in horses. So they've been used for a really long time in horses, and very few have reported gastrointestinal side effects at normal doses. Dogs, on the other hand, given some of these traditional equine non steroidal anti inflammatories, they'll show signs of gastritis and digested blood in the stool within a few days of starting on these drugs. So, some drugs are just totally tolerated by horses and totally not tolerated by dogs. And of course, if they're not tolerated by dogs, you can pretty much guarantee they're not tolerated by cats. Just going back to a couple things that we always talk to owners about when we're um, dispensing the non steroidal anti inflammatories. I noted that the dogs can show signs of gastritis and digested blood in the stool within a few days. So when we're dispensing this kind of medication, we always want to tell the owner, watch for signs of vomiting. If they start vomiting, stop the medication, call the vet. If they have a bowel movement that's very black, so it has melina, digested blood in it, then stop the, the non steroidals and call the vet because those, of course, are signs of GI upset. And then the melina, the dark tarry stool, is a sign of digested blood, which would be a gastric ulcer. So, little tips and tricks for use when we're talking to clients. Cats, in general, are considered to be poorly tolerant of non steroidal anti inflammatories, mostly from their reduced ability to eliminate the drug through their liver and hence the increased risk for accumulation and toxicity. Aspirin has been used safely in cats when the dose is used in small amounts and the dose interval is extended sort of to two to three days. That way it's accommodating for the cat's slow metabolism of these drugs so that we're not increasing the accumulation of, of that drug, of that non in their bloodstream. And we'll talk about aspirin a little bit later on. So let's look at some of the individual non anti-inflammatories. So we're going to look at phenylbutazone, which is typically an NSAID of choice for horses. So it's important to be aware of the interactions of phenylbutazone with other medications the animal is taking. For example, uh, phenylbutazone, which we often call but, induces increased hepatic metabolism of other drugs metabolized through the same way. So what that means, it's similar to phenobarbital in that it increases the level of enzymes in the liver, 
that will break down that drug and metabolize it. So that being said, if we are giving this drug, phenylbutazone, with another drug such as a barbiturate, which does the same thing, then we're going to get increased metabolism of the other drug, and we're going to get increased metabolism of phenylbutazole or phenobutazone, so not ideal. We have to be very aware of monitoring the effectiveness of the drug to ensure that the liver, of course, is not metabolizing it with interactions from other drugs metabolized through the liver. The adverse effects of phenobutazone are similar to those of other NSAIDs. So we've got risk of gastrointestinal ulceration, renal papillary necrosis if the renal perfusion is decreased, so if it's an animal with hypotension, and retention of water and sodium from decreased renal function. Two other adver adverse effects of phenobutazone are bone marrow suppression, resulting in neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and anemia, and tissue necrosis if the drug is injected intramuscularly or subcutaneously, which is really scary. So the bone marrow suppression is more common in people and dogs than in horses. We typically don't get it in horses, especially if we're sticking with the regular doses. In horses, phenylbutazone should be given intravenously or by mouth only. So accidental perivascular injection, which means that we meant to go into the vein, but accidentally some of it leaked around the vein, can cause really scary, really severe inflammation and actually cause tissue necrosis. So if we decide not to read the label and go ahead and give this injection intramuscularly, like maybe in the trapezius muscles or the gluteal muscles on the horses, you're going to get sloughing of that tissue. So that tissue in the next week to 10 days is going to be horribly painful, red, and it will just start to peel off the body. It's really disgusting. So we don't want to do this. Accidental injection of phenobutazone into the carotid artery can cause marked CNS stimulation. So that would include seizures and collapse. For this reason, the vet professional, so the RVT in this case, has to be really careful to ensure that the drug is administered properly. So we know that when we're giving a jugular injection on a horse, that's our favorite vein to use on the horse. It's easily accessible and it's really big, so it's nice and easy for us to do. But if we're giving that an injection to the jugular vein, we always have to remember that the carotid artery sits so close to the jugular vein. So it sits just deep to the jugular vein. So if we choose a needle that's the inappropriate size, a needle that's too long for the jugular vein, then of course we're going to poke right through the jugular vein and into the carotid artery. And then all of a sudden you're giving a drug and you end up with a huge horse that is dropped or seizuring. So we have to be very cautious of that. Always read your labels. Always, always read the labels on your drugs. So then we have acetosalicylic acid, which is aspirin, and it's a fairly safe, non-selective COX inhibiting enzyme, or sorry, NSAID. <laughs> Owners commonly give aspirin to their pets without asking advice from the vet which is really frustrating because it does interact with other drugs. It's a non-steroidal. So anytime an owner gives an anti-inflammatory at home, we have to be cautious of what drugs we're going to give them in clinic because we don't want to overdose them on anti-inflammatories and we don't want to give them something like a steroidal anti-inflammatory because there's a high chance that they're going to get gastric ulcers. So with this, you can't take it personally, but I find anytime we do an exam with an animal that's painful, I always ask, have you given any medication at home? And they always say no, always say no. And then I'll say, so you haven't given any ibuprofen, aspirin, or Tylenol. Sometimes at that point, owners will say, oh, that's right, I gave a baby aspirin or I gave a Tylenol. Okay, good to know. Sometimes they lie. <laughs> I think it's because they're embarrassed, but they lie to our faces and then it takes speaking with the doctor to get the answer that in fact they did give two aspirins or they did give a Tylenol because they thought that that was okay. So we have to keep that in mind. It takes a lot of questioning sometimes to get to the bottom of what drugs have been given at home. And of course, they can affect our treatment protocol, which can be scary. So going back to aspirin, aspirin belongs to a larger group of compounds known as the salicylates, which include bismuth subsalicylate, which is found in Pepto-Bismol. So we have to be cautious as well about the amount of Pepto-Bismol that's given as well as aspirin, because of course, we can start to get a higher end dose of that salicylate type product. <laughs> 
Aspirin decreases inflammation by blocking the cyclooxygenase pathway, so it's a COX inhibitor. Because thromboxane normally promotes platelet aggregation, so in this case, not only is it the COX-1 and COX-2 non-selective inhibitor, but it's also going to inhibit, it, inhibit the thromboxanes, which of course is another pathway of the COX enzyme that creates different results for the body. In general, we use aspirin for its benefits of thromboxane inhibition. So when we inhibit thromboxane, we're typically focusing on inhibiting platelet aggregation or platelet clumping. So typically, uh, daily doses of aspirin are often given to reduce the likelihood of clot formation and subse subsequent blockage of coronary blood vessels in people at risk of heart attacks. It has been used in the past for dogs with heartworm infection because they often have narrowed pulmonary vessels that cause, or sorry, caused by the proliferation of the endothelial lining of the vessel and effects stimulated by thromboxanes. So when dogs have heartworm, they get essentially an increase in that endothelial lining. It gets thickened, which causes narrowing of those vessels. So in the past, doctors often prescribed aspirin as a method for inhibiting that endothelial cell or endothelial lining increase. So in the end, creates a lesser narrowing effect of those vessels. So this was commonly prescribed to dogs who had heartworm for this reason, to reduce the amount of thromboxanes and therefore reduce the amount of endothelial cell uh, tissue proliferation. However, now we know more and some cardiologists advise against using aspirin for this purpose because of the increased risk for hemorrhage due to poor platelet adhesion. So we have to, of course, balance the benefits and the risks. And is it scarier to have narrowed vessels or is it scarier to bleed out from a hemorrhage because we don't have any platelets that are clumping together to form a clot. So a little bit scary on either end. Cats, it has been used successfully in cats with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And if you remember, that's the condition where the heart muscle thickens, which results in that stiff ventricular wall and of course reduced cardiac output. So it's that thickened a cardiac wall in the left ventricle that just results in poor efficiency of the heart. So with this cardiomyopathy, with this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they often have a turbulent blood flow, so not a nice smooth blood flow within the heart. The turbulent blood flow causes platelets to clump and form clots within the heart, which is really scary. These clots normally form on the left side of the heart, and they flow with the blood into the aorta and commonly large at the caudal bifurcation of the dorsal aorta. So that's where the, the dorsal aorta, the descending aorta, divides into the hind left and right legs. The resulting clot, which we call a saddle thrombus, can markedly reduce blood flow to the hind legs, resulting in eventual loss of the use of the hind legs which is really scary. So when these cats come in, saddle thrombus, clinical signs are the cat is in extreme pain, extreme pain. Sometimes they're foaming at the mouth if they also have a clot that entered into their lungs and they can't use their back legs. Their back legs are cold. They don't have any reflexes in their back legs and they are just screaming in pain. So these cats, it's detrimental when they come in with saddle thrombus. It is essentially an immediate euthanasia because at this point, we don't have an option to remove the clot from their, their, their aorta. However, if a cat is diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, aspirin is one of the drugs that's been advocated in these cats to reduce the clot formation associated with that cardiac disease. So that's one benefit of aspirin that we definitely can use it in cats who are identified as having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So going back, because it's uh, it has a very short half-life and the GI side effects in horses, it's not really very common for use in horses. It doesn't really control inflammation that well. However, it's been used as part of the treatment protocol for uveitis in horses. So inflammation of the iris and the ciliary body of the eye. Considerations with cats, so like all other NSAIDs, aspirin's metabolized by the liver. Cats have little of the enzymes needed for the liver or within the liver in order to metabolize it appropriately. And aspirin is metabolized much more slowly in cats because of this than in other species. So if we look at the stats here, aspirin has 
a half life of one and a half hours in people, roughly eight hours in dogs, so we could give it up to three times a day in dogs if needed, but it has a half life of 30 hours in the cat. So that's like a day and a half in the cat. So with many other drugs, the aspirin dosage for cats is lower than dosages for other species and usually consists of a baby aspirin, so an 81 milligram aspirin, every two to three days. If used prudently, so if we're very cautious with its use, then aspirin definitely can be safe for cats. And then we have these guys. We have ibuprofen, ketoprofen, and naproxen, which are derivatives of propionic acid, and they share common modes of action and side effects. Ketoprofen and naproxen are used in horses. However, the use of any of the propionic acid compounds in dogs has a really high incidence of gastritis and ulcers. Few adverse reactions with these drugs have been reported in horses, although gastric mucosal damage and renal papillary necrosis are possible. In contrast to the horses, in dogs, after two to six, two to six days of treatments, dogs consistently experience vomiting because of the fairly high incidence of side effects and the availability of much safer NSAIDs. These propionic acid derivatives aren't usually recommended for use in dogs. Definitely not in cats. So in general, important for us as RVTs, we should definitely know the names of these drugs. So their trade names, they are generally over the counter in order to link them up with potential medications that the owners have given their animal without asking. So ibuprofen is typically sold under the name ibuprofen or Advil or Motrin, and naproxen is typically Aleve. Ketoprofen, I believe it's prescription only for people, so you just have to ask specifically about it. Then we have banamine, which is common for treatment of equine colic. So banamine is a COX inhibitor and has an anti-prostaglandin, anti-inflammatory effect. It also has an analgesic component. So this is one that works on two methods, so a true analgesic and an anti-inflammatory. The analgesic component is more potent than that of many of the older NSAIDs, such as phenobutazone. In addition to the analgesic and anti-inflammatory effects, Banamine also blocks the effects of endotoxins, which are poisons produced by the liberation of toxins from the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria associated with colic in horses. So colic, uh, horses who have colic, they get this pain associated with endotoxins as well, which sort of creates this negative effect and a buildup of gas. So banamine can actually block or prevent the release of those endotoxins, which is a beneficial method for analgesic effect. In dogs, banamine provides analgesic superior to that of aspirin or phenobutazone, and it's been used as an analgesic in dogs with hip dysplasia, arthritis, intervertebral disc disease, and anterior uveitis. However, dogs are very sensitive to the gastrointestinal side effects of, of banamine, and some clinicians recommend using banamine for no longer than three days for risk of vomiting, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, which is vomiting and having diarrhea filled with blood, and pyloric ulceration, so just a few risks. So that being said, the importance of this one, because a lot of horse owners will have banamine kicking around, they typically have like big jugs of banamine for times of equine colic or other inflammatory needs, it's very common for horse owners to give their dogs banamine when their dogs are limping or if they've had porcupine quills or anything along those lines. So if you're doing house calls with a vet or for a vet to go see equine patients and owners ask you about banamine, just remember that it is quite dangerous to have a dog on banamine for prolonged use. So three days max. And if they kind of hint that they give banamine here and there, then that's your opportunity to jump in and say, if you're using banamine, check with the vet, make sure you've got the right dose so we're not overdosing the dog. And definitely for no longer than three days, because some of those gastric ulcers are going to be much more expensive and challenging to treat than it is to go to the vet and get some Medicam for your dog. So of course, in contrast to dogs, horses are relatively resistant to the side effects and they can receive up to five times the recommended dose without negative side effects, which is pretty darn amazing. So banamine has also been used extra label, so off label in cattle, swine, and other species. Just remember that the doses are based on anecdotal evidence, so they're not based on trials. 
That's really important too, because again, if you're doing those house calls for production farms, so for cows or pigs, and the the owner of the farm or the, the owner of the animal suggests using banamine, you have to be really careful because if it's off label and they're production animals for milk or for meat, then it may not be accepted by the regulatory bodies. So we have to ensure that we're only using drugs on production animals that are accepted for regulations in regard to the selling of meat or the selling of milk, milk for human consumption. So then we have Arquel. It's most commonly administered as granules that are mixed up in the food and it accumulates in pretty good quantities in the joint fluid after oral administration. So it's kind of neat that this drug has anti-inflammatory and analgesic actions and it's used in horses to treat lameness associated with joint inflammation. So it actually accumulates inside the joint capsule to get the problem where it's starting. It's also been used to treat chronic joint degenerative diseases in dogs, such as hip dysplasia or chronic arthritis. However, like banamine, Arquel is well tolerated in horses up to four times, but can produce, or sorry, up to four times its uh, dose in horses can still produce very few side effects. So that's kind of neat, but it can produce gastrointestinal signs in dogs with long-term use. So when dogs are being treated with, of course, Arquel, the owner should know or be advised to watch for anorexia, diarrhea, or changes in the stool color. Again, looking for that dark stool, that melina, that might indicate gastrointestinal side effects. Because again, if it's just because of cost and the challenge of getting to the vet to get their dog looked at, it's way cheaper long-term to get a bottle of Medicam than it is to continuously treat gastric ulcers in their dogs. And then we have this one, which is kind of neat and strange, DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide. It's an excellent industrial solvent derived from wood pulp that's also used to dissolve drugs that don't readily dissolve in water. So it's kind of a weird one. It's technically not a drug, but it's an industrial solvent. Kind of like potassium bromide technically isn't a drug. So it's interesting so in addition, this compound also has anti-inflammatory mechanism different from other NSAIDs. So DMSO is not an anti-prostaglandin drug, but it works by inactivating the destructive process caused by superoxide radicals, so free radicals in the body. These free radicals produce hydroxyl radicals and hydrox hydrogen peroxide, which damage cells. DMSO traps or scavenges, so kind of takes away the hydroxyl radicals, while the metabolite byproduct essentially of DMSO traps those oxygen, those um, hydrogen peroxide type radicals. The combined activity reduces the cellular damage produced by the inflammatory process. DMSO is used topically and parenterally, primarily in horses. And it's also a component of some otics, of some ear preparations used in dogs and cats. DMSO is widely used extra-label, so off-label, used, sorry, in off-label ways to treat a variety of conditions, including swelling from central nervous system trauma, mastitis, mammary swelling associated with nursing, post-operative pain, burns, and other superficial trauma. However, the only approved uses are for acute injury associated with trauma or as an anti-inflammatory in otic preparations. So keep that in mind. If we are using DMSO for larger variations of problems, it will not be supported by the company, by the manufacturer. So DMSO is known for its ability to penetrate intact skin and has been used as a vehicle to carry dissolved drugs into the body when applied topically. It can also carry toxins, so bad things, of course, or harmful substances when it enters an animal or penetrates the skin of the person applying it. So we have to be very, very cautious when we're applying DMSO. We have to be sure that the area that we're applying it to is thoroughly cleansed cleansed to avoid absorption of things like microbes, bacterial toxins, or other chemicals such as oil or grease or insecticides. So we have to be very, very cautious about that. If we're applying it, we have to readily scrub the area first. DMSO is also available as an industrial grade solvent. And although considerably less expensive than the medical grade form, the industrial grade should never be used on veterinary patients because of toxic impurities that are found in many of these products. 
People applying DMSO should protect themselves by wearing high quality rubber gloves during topical application. Because again, whatever we're applying within the DMSO can get readily absorbed through our skin as well. Likewise, if we have any dirt, bacteria, grease, or otherwise on our hands, then the DMSO can actually carry that directly into our, our bloodstream. The smell of DMSO is said to resemble garlic or raw oysters, and in general, the odor is evident during topical application, and the drug can sometimes be tasted it or tasted after it's absorbed by the body. So that's what humans report, that you can sometimes taste that funky smell after application. After DMSO is applied topically, redness, edema, and paritis might develop at the application site. These reactions are reflective of a release of histamine and other vasoactive amines from the mast cells in the skin. So the cutaneous reaction is typically mild, but sometimes a more severe reaction may occur if they have mast cell tumors. So we have to just have caution if an animal is known to have mast cell tumors, then they might get more of a severe reaction to DMSO. If given intravenously to horses, DMSO can cause hemolysis and passage of hemoglobin in the urine, so hemoglobinuria. Severe hemolysis, which is the lysis of red blood cells, and release of hemoglobin can adversely affect the kidneys. Therefore, hemolysis should be minimized by using DMSO solutions with a concentration less than 20% for IV administration. So we can use it safely for intravenous use, but less than 20% only. In large doses, DMSO has produced defects in the offspring of hamsters and avian species. So these effects haven't been demonstrated in other species, but the use of DMSO in pregnant animals should be weighed against any benefits, right? Because especially if it's a production animal and that animal is going to produce to be sold or whatever reason it may be, we don't want to be affecting the potential offspring. Conservative approach in this case would include a use of other NSAIDs, that have been documented to be safe in pregnant animals. Why risk it, right? So non-steroidal anti-inflammatory summary. They are never to be used with steroids due to the increased risk of gastrointestinal ulceration or deterioration. Caution with dosing. We want to keep, in general, an animal on the lowest dose possible because if we can get away with positive effects on a low dose, then there's no need to increase the dose to a higher end dose, which could, of course, unmask kidney issues and, of course, put them at higher risk for gastrointestinal issues. When we give animals NSAIDs at home, some of them, I think it's Rimadyl, that comes in a nice little blister pack of these tasty chews. Challenge with that is that we have to keep these tasty little non sterile anti-inflammatory chews seriously out of the reach of some of these animals. I definitely have had cats that will go through my grocery bags and pick out the food that they want to eat, and I'm certain that if I had a tasty little NSAID, they would do the exact same thing. And then think about how many sneaky labs and sneaky beagles are out there that would happily and readily jump on the kitchen counter, grab that blister pack of NSAIDs, and then all of a sudden they've had 10 times their dose. So not ideal. Kidney function and gastrointestinal health are really important prior to starting non steroidal anti-inflammatory treatment. And generally we don't combine NSAIDs. So if they're going home with Medicam, we're not going to add on Rimadyl, okay? Because again, we start risking those gastrointestinal effects and the kidney effects. Cats, as always, we're more conservative with cats and they get a lower dose than dogs. So then we have some non, non steroidal anti-inflammatories. So these are other drugs that tend to be classed into the anti-inflammatory class, but they technically are not. So acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, is a common over-the-counter pain medication that people use quite often. It's not anti-inflammatory. It's, anal it's an analgesic and an antipyretic properties. So it has analgesic and anti-fever properties. It does not block prostaglandin formation. Instead, it decreases that central nervous system perception of pain. So Tylenol, acetaminophen, does not have gastrointestinal effects of NSAIDs, nor does it interfere with platelet clumping because it doesn't act in the same way. However, acetaminophen can have serious side effects in some degree, and especially serious side effects in cats. So acetaminophen is normally conjugated with glucocuronic acid and sulfate for metabolism and elimination in the liver. 
a small portion of, of acetaminophen is also metabolized to a toxic metabolite. So it's kind of like a byproduct when acetaminophen is taken, the liver creates this toxic metabolites. In most species, the toxic metabolite is quickly conjugated to form a non-toxic metabolite. So in humans, we create a non-toxic non metabolite and we're good. We can excrete it, we can metabolize it, no problem. Because of the relatively less effective conjugation in cats, more of that toxic metabolite tends to be produced. Unfortunately, the amount of the enzyme in the liver that's needed to biotransform this toxic metabolite to a non-toxic metabolite is very, very limited in the cat. So for cats, I'm going to just show you this picture here. Cats who have had amino acetaminophen and have acetaminophen toxicity. Acetaminophen at a dose of 50 milligrams to 60 milligrams per kilo in a cat can poison the cat. And then a single extra strength acetaminophen, 500 milligrams, can easily kill an average sized cat. So just have a look at this picture here. So this cat has chocolate colored tongue and mucous membranes. And we're going to talk about why on the next slide. So with cats, the toxic metabolite accumulates in the liver and in other tissues, which produces this cellular destruction. In addition to liver damage, the red blood cells are also severely affected. The hemoglobin in red blood cells is converted to methemoglobin, which is much less capable of efficient oxygen transport. Increased red blood cell hemolysis and Heinz bodies are evident on blood smears, and cats with methemoglobinemia, which is quite a mouthful to say, have that chocolate-colored mucous membranes and dark urine caused by methemoglobin in the blood and the urine. So like I said before, 50 to 60 milligrams per kilogram of acetaminophen will kill, or can be very, very toxic to a cat. And then of course, a 500 milligram, which is an extra strength Tylenol, can kill a cat pretty quickly. In dogs, we definitely can use acetaminophen safely. And a higher dose, so above 150 milligrams per kilogram, is required before, before signs of hepatic necrosis, weight loss, and icterus become evident. So dogs have definitely a higher threshold, and we can use Tylenol as part of an anesthetic protocol to reduce um, pain, to reduce the perception of pain. Treatment of acetaminophen toxicity, especially in cats, but dogs as well, focuses on providing what's needed to convert the toxic metabolite to its non-toxic form. The drug most commonly used to treat acetaminophen toxicity is acetylcysteine, which is mucal mist. So again, key points, cats not well tolerated at all. They'll get that lysis of red blood cells, the hemoglobin's converted to methemoglobin, which then results in these chocolate brown mucous membranes. So if you're performing a physical exam on a cat and the owner's wondering what's wrong with it, you really need to find out how much acetaminophen that owner gave the cat. So then we have this other class of medications. We've got chondroprotectants, which prevent or reverse joint cartilage degeneration. Adequin, and adequin is fairly common, especially in older dogs, especially in older larger dogs. And the goal of adequin is to trap water in the cartilage, providing sponginess to the joints. So to reduce that natural flexibility and sponginess to the joint tissue. It reduces the enzymes that cause cartilage breakdown as well. And then we have hyaluronic acid, which could be called legend or hyalovet, hyalovet, um, also, too, I see it typically as generic name, hyaluronic acid. And this is essential to synovial fluid as a joint lubricant. So it acts as an anti-inflammatory through the scavenge of free radicals. Carrying on down the line of chondroprotectants, we have glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate, which are referred to nutraceuticals because they're used like drugs, but they're actually natural products found in the body or used by the body for normal healthy function. A cosequin is your typical one that the doctor will be prescribing as a glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate supplement. The challenge with nutraceuticals is of course that they don't undergo the same level of testing and regulations that drugs would go through, that actual medications would go through. So with that, we have rough, rough estimates of how much the drug or sorry, how much of the nutraceutical is needed to produce an effect. But then at the same time, every single producer of that nutraceutical 
they don't have to go through the same testing. So we worry about things like the actual concentration of the product within the tablet, etc. So they're not as well regulated as medications. Posamine and chondroitin sulfate are actually precursors to the PS gags formation by the chondrocytes, so the cartilage forming cells, and for the proteoglycans that are found in the cartilage itself. Chondroitin sulfate binds with the collagen fibers in the cartilage and supports the collagen strands. The presence of both chondroitin and glucosamine in the serum increases the efficiency of the chondrocytes to actually repair the cartilage and it stimulates production of the hyaluronic acid. And it inhibits some of the destructive enzymes found in injured or diseased cartilage, which is pretty great. Challenge, as I mentioned before, is the variability in the amount of active products, so active ingredient within the product. Some of the products are extracts from living organisms, such as mussels, sea cucumber, sea algae, shark cartilage, which we all know we should avoid shark cartilage at this point, and others are purified extracts, which are often more expensive. Cosequin is perhaps the best known of the glucosamine chondroitin sulfate nutraceuticals used in veterinary medicine, although you'll see now a lot of companies have glucosamine chondroitin sulfate mixes. Typically, I think Cosequin is a tablet that is oral, of course, and otherwise you can definitely get pumps that you can squeeze onto the animal's food. And that is it.